us refers to um, uh, an initiative that it comes out of uh, Converge's International Ministries Department called From Scattered to Gathered. And um, we'll, we'll, I'll spend a little bit of time a little later on describing what that means exactly, but um, there were a group of six, uh, and I'll introduce um, our colleagues a little bit later on, but we're so happy that you've uh, taken, made the time to join us this morning. And um, I wanted to thank some folks, in particular um, people near. Uh, we are a part here in the Twin Cities of a, a Disciple Making Practitioners Network. And they have been um, just a great support for us and we're excited to be a part of their team. So uh, just a shout out to, uh, to Jim Lilly, who is our facilitator. And I think a couple of our brothers, Randy and Brad, are joining us this morning. So grateful to have their participation. Then we have um, some folks from Wisconsin and uh, the UP um, who are part of a disciple making network. Um, I think they've changed the name. It used to be the DMM, Disciple Making Movement Huddle of Wisconsin and the, and the UP, the Upper Peninsula. But um, I think they might have changed their name. But um, um, if they're in your groups, maybe that will come out. But um, Marcus, Ross, um, thanks for all your help. Thanks for the invitations that you extended. We have a lot of folks joining us from Wisconsin. Um, and we have a number of churches representing Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, South Dakota, North Dakota. So welcome to all of you. And then we have our people from um, a distance that are joining us. We have both coasts represented, um, California um, and Maryland. And um, uh, we also have Pennsylvania, Florida, and Texas. And I don't think, I'm, I'm wondering if I'm forgetting a state. Forgive me if I am. Um, but we're so glad that, um, that you're joining us from uh, uh, far away, but not as far as um, a couple of others that are joining us. Um, the, I think the Long, well, I didn't check Google to find out who's uh, the, um, joining us from the longest distance, but we have a good friend from, from saint Lee, France, who is joining us. And um, also our our good colleagues and friends from Dakar, Senegal and West Africa who are joining us. I'll introduce uh, Roy. First of all, we're just grateful to, to have, his, have him join us this morning. Um, and he's, uh, he's a pastor and he's an author and he's um, a, a North America director for an organization called uh, New Generations. He'll probably talk a little more about that, but I have to admit that I'm a little nervous introducing uh, in introducing you, Roy, because the first and only time that I ever introduced author, it was my father-in-law, who was a, a New Testament scholar. He is a New Testament scholar. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, Dad. Um, and he, while we were living and working in West Africa, he, he and, and um, my wife's mom came for a visit. Um, and uh, we were attending an international church. And and uh, so I asked if he'd be willing to share the message. And um, unfortunately, I introduced him as the author of the gospel according to Luke, instead of, of course, as the author of a commentary on the gospel of Luke. Now, I thought he would be impressed. He was not, <laughs> to my chagrin. So... So Roy, if you don't mind, I'm gonna let you introduce yourself however you'd like. Again, we're, we're so grateful for um, uh, your, your presence with us this morning and um, we're grateful for the, the opportunity to collaborate with, um, with New Generations as well. So um, Roy, take it away. Well, thank you, Bruce. I appreciate the opportunity to, to be here. Uh, I know we were all hoping to be face to face. Yeah. First with the Wisconsin crowd and then coming over to uh, Minnesota. And unfortunately, uh, this uh, very strange season in our lives has um, created this opportunity. So um, I'm uh, honored that you're here. I, I know it says um, maybe one of a couple of things about you. Um, 
One, it says is that you can't just get enough of Zoom, and so you wanted one more Zoom meeting. Um, or it may be you're bored and desperate and need something to do. Uh, or maybe you have the same desperation in your soul that I have. Um, that is uh, to see um, more people uh, impacted with this good news of God leaving heaven, coming to the earth, living and dying and rising again and offering life in this world and the world to come. Um, and uh, so I'm just privileged to be here and, and to have all of uh, these, this, uh, these kingdom hours that are going to be chewed up in this time. So I hope that uh, I, we might come out in some ways uh, stirred up. Uh, so I'm going to do a couple of things. Uh, I'm going to tell a little bit of my story. For those of you who read Spin Matches, you've heard it, so I don't want to uh, belabor it too long and kind of tell you how I pivoted to where I'm at. And then I want to put you in groups. And I want you to respond to some questions in those groups uh, based on your situation. Um, I know if you're like me, uh, you don't need another expert on Zoom trying to tell you how to survive the COVID crisis. I'm surprised how many experts suddenly popped up um, in our world that, that could solve the COVID crisis for us um, when none of them had ever lived through anything like this in their life anyway. Um, so I don't want to be that guy uh, today. Um, so I, I hope this can be a discussion. Um, you've got a chat box down below. Uh, feel free at any moment you want a question comes up. I can't guarantee you will be able to get to all of them, but just uh, click on that chat box, put a question in there. And uh, we'll attempt to, to let some of those questions define the agenda that, that we have today um, in our time together. So, um, you know, as I think about my own story, um, uh, like you, uh, most of you probably, uh, I got into uh, leading uh, ministry opportunities simply because uh, early in my teenage years, I began to have an opportunity to to uh, come to faith. Uh, Jesus radically changed my life. I had this uh, abject fear of death, uh, highly insecure, uh, even though I grew up in a decent family that most people would consider, you know, good mother, good father, but I just could not be loved enough by people um, to, to really satisfy this ache in my soul. And when the story of God leaving heaven come into earth and dying in my place and offering me life uh, came into my world. It, it transformed me in very tangible ways, uh, changed me internally. And it was just like any other great thing in my life that comes to, I want to give it away. I want other people to enjoy it. And so my life began um, in the spiritual journey with this eagerness to give away life. And so I went on this typical track um, I went to college. Um, I, I got a degree in, in Greek. Um, my parents were um, sorely concerned about, you know, what I would do with that. Um, but I went on to, I got a graduate degree in theology and then went into church ministry and began to work in, in church ministry. It wasn't until um, my late 30s that I had this radical itch to say, um, I signed up for something that I don't think is working like I hoped it would work. And so I began um, this, this search for things. And I, I put it in my own words. I said, is there a scalable model of ministry? Because most of what I see and I've been, been involved in was, was one generational type ministry. Uh, from the moment I came to faith, I knew that making disciples was vital. I, I knew that that was Jesus's call on my life. And so all throughout my ministry, I focused in on making disciples. Um, but one of the things that, that really captured me is, is that my disciple making was, was one generational. My disciples weren't really multiplying, weren't making disciples. I was involved in a typical church in some ways. I started Shoal Creek Community Church uh, 25 plus years ago. Um, we were started out of a Willow Creek model uh, and still today kind of uh, function that way, um, believe it or not. Um, 
And uh, so we were really radically focused on reaching lost people. And uh, we had you know, people come into faith and baptizing people. And it was, it was, um, it was amazing. But most of it was gathered around um, this campus that we had. And it was gathered around this, this weekly service. Um, I'm a graduate of Dallas Theological Cemetery, Seminary, excuse me. Um, and uh, so uh, I think most of you probably know the, the, the theological landscape here, because that's important as I tell this next story. Um, in this season of my life, when I'm, I'm disturbed by this idea of scalable model of ministry, um, I'm reading some books and engaging with people, um, but also God interrupts it by uh, giving me a dream. Now, I, I think if you do know the theological landscape of the world, a degree from Dallas Seminary and dreams, um, they, they don't always mix. You know, they don't always go together. Um, but I had this vivid dream. And this vivid dream was that uh, my prayers were being answered by God. And when we started Shoal Creek, we had this desire. Uh, we, we are in Clay County, Missouri. I'm in Kansas City, so north northeast side of Kansas City. The, any of you that know the landscape, I-35, which runs right through you know Minneapolis, runs right through here as well, and, and we're right on that I-35 corridor. And so, uh, we were praying that for the 300,000 people that existed within about a 30-minute drive of us, um, we would make it hard for them to go to hell because of our presence here. And so we would pray regularly for those 300,000 people that God would give us an audience, that it, he would stir their souls, that he would bring us in relationship with them, that somehow uh, he would bring them to us uh, so that we might be able to, to provide them an opportunity to drink from the well, um, that, that living water that we had been drinking from. And so uh, in this dream, God answers this prayer and all 300,000 people decide to come to Shoal Creek on Sunday morning. Um, and if you can imagine what that would look like, I'm sure that wherever you're at, uh, the infrastructure uh, won't handle 300,000 people at the same time coming. And what's odd about it is we only have 425 parking spots and maybe uh, 1,200 seats. We, we, we might be able to pack 1,600 people in if we just crammed them in there. Um, and so uh, all of these people started descending on, on Shoal Creek, uh, this campus. And it was, it, it was that dream that turned to a nightmare because people who uh, God had answered our prayer that their hearts would be inclined toward us and, and tried to get there, couldn't get there because of the traffic uh, was just you know, crazy. And, and, and so they went back home. And uh, I was reading a book, um, a really, really old book, uh, called the spontaneous expansion of the church and its hindrances, and, and in that book, uh, Roland Allen says it somehow. Not this is not an exact quote, but he says, you know, when when what you're praying for, um, and and your strategy don't seem to to match up, then you might want to check your strategy because your prayers are probably more in line with the heart of God, and and that that quote or that passage just rang out to me as I realized that, you know, we're, what we're praying for and, and the strategy God had kind of showed me in this dream, they don't match up. And so that sent me on a, a, a worldwide search to figure out who could, who could help me understand uh, what, would, what would a simple, repeatable strategy of the gospel moving from person to person look like in that process. And it took me through a lot of of uh, internal struggles. Um, I, I've come to call them now the, the, the mindset shifts that I had to, to go through to, to make this transition. One of the mindset shifts uh, that, that began it all was looking at the Great Commission. And I, I looked at it and I said, okay, Father, I have made disciples. And, and what I heard back from God is that's not what I called you to do. And, and that was a stunning moment in my life to, to have uh, what I considered to be just a, a plain, clear, simple understanding of Matthew 28, 16 through 20, uh, having been impressed deep in my soul and discovering I had seen it wrong. 
Um, and what I discovered is, is that God didn't call me to make disciples. He called me to make disciple making disciples. And, it, and even though that may seem like a play on words, um, it, it is profoundly um, uh, radical for me because I had made disciples out of my personality, my passions, my giftedness. Uh, I love to read. I have, you know, theological education, all that kind of stuff. Love to engage in deep theological discussions. And so this one generation of disciples I had made um, had grown radically um, in, in their understanding of who Jesus was and how he had impacted their life and how their story and God's story mixed together. Um, but the, the methodologies that I used to impact their lives weren't repeatable by them. They didn't have my gifts, my passions, my education, or anything. And, and so I was just one generation deep in passages like, you know, 2 Timothy 2.2 2 and uh, areas where I'd see this generational thing were disturbing to me, but, but I didn't ever stop to really get a hold of it. So um, it, it caused me to sort of move around the world and, and move around the U.S. and talk to a lot of people. And I, I ran across uh, what it then was called City Team International a group of, of folks, uh, mainly focused in Sub-Saharan Africa, but some in South Asia and, and Indonesia and other places. And I began to explore the strategies that they were using. At that point, they were called CPM, Church Planting Movements. And uh, we've, we've come to really describe it as disciple-making movements now. Um, but uh, it was a simple strategy, a simple, repeatable strategy that could be housed in, in sort of three basic words, uh, uh, letting people hear from God, uh, letting them learn to obey what God has to say, and then asking them and showing them how to share it with the people in their lives. And those sim three simple things um, really began to create a revolution in, in my mind. And so it, it led me to uh, begin to experiment in the local church with what would it look like to boil the disciple making process down to something as simple as what I began to see in the gospels of Jesus. Um, you know, in that, that book that Bruce's father-in-law wrote, the gospel of Luke. Um, just kidding there, Bruce, but uh, you know, it, it began to help me see that um, there was a, there was a simplicity to Jesus's disciple making activity. And so he began with, uh, with his, folks that, that he began to work with. His first call to them was obedience. Follow me. And so they followed him, an act of obedience uh, into this disciple-making process. And this simple, repeatable strategy began to take hold. But as I, as I began to look at it and, and look at what was happening around the world, it led me to a collision. And I'm, I'm abbreviating this story, so I apologize. But uh, uh, it led me to a collision because I existed in a local church to do what most of you do on, on, on Sundays. I have a message to prepare. Uh, we have kids ministry. Uh, you know, we, we have the, all of the stuff that looks like, you know, the Western church and stuff. And so early on, some of my uh, uh, early influencers were encouraging me to shut it down and get rid of it. And I began to, to ask some hard questions about what we were doing. And, and what we were doing was, was effective. I mean, it was moderately effective. We were still seeing people come to Christ and, and, being, and growing up and, and impacting you know, their families and, and their workplaces and stuff like that. But, um, but it, wasn't, it, it wasn't going to be the... the um, the uh, strategy that God used to answer our prayers. Uh, we were never going to see this local facility uh, and this ministry out of this local facility uh, be that which, which reached Clay County. And I began to then say, okay, would, would that happen with all the churches? If we gathered together with all the churches, I began to realize is that none of us had a strategy that was, was going to allow the Great Commission to be fulfilled in Clay County or even in Kansas City. And so I, I began this you know, understanding of what it looks like to uh, take this uh, disciple-making movement strategy, which was simply getting people's fingerprints on the Bible, 
uh, from, from their pre-Christian days, uh, teaching them how to read the Bible, uh, how to learn to obey it, how to learn to establish that this is God speaking in this passage. What am I going to do this week about, about this? And then share it with, with someone in their life. Share what God is doing in their life. And that, that simple, repeatable strategy began to take hold. But we had to ask ourselves, what do we do with this thing, this legacy church that we have called Shoal Creek? Um, and it was out of that that this concept of a hybrid church arose, this idea of having uh, two separate power plants inside one mission. And the mission was basically to see the gospel uh, reach every man, woman, and child, you know, so that they would have a repeated opportunity to see, hear, and respond to Jesus. I mean, that was our, our basic strategy. And so we felt like that the Legacy Church still had a piece of that strategy, but we also put in another power plant or another engine, so electric and gas, just like I'm sure some of, someone on this call, as many of you as that there are, someone has a hybrid car. Um, so electric and gas, they both, they're very different. They're very radically um, design theories and all kinds of stuff that are different, different tools, uh, different training and that kind of stuff to work on each side, but they all come together uh, for the mission of the car. And the mission of the car is just basically transportation. And so we saw that the mission of Shoal Creek, um, you know, is really to make Jesus accessible to all people. And so we have these two sides, these, these two strategies. Once we, we refer to as a come strategy, still a, a very attractional strategy. We realize that some people, especially in our, our area, we have about 24% um, of the people here represent themselves as Catholic, 21% represent themselves as Lutheran. So about 50% of our population has this very liturgical background and a building and a space is, uh, is sometimes helpful to them in terms of approaching Jesus. And so Jesus, uh, that building and that Sunday morning rhythm and all that kind of stuff helps make Jesus accessible to them. But there are another 50% that's never coming. I don't care how wild or crazy we get on Sunday morning. I don't care who we have. Uh, we can have Patrick Mahomes there on Sunday, which, you know, everyone, uh, for those of you that don't know Patrick Mahomes, surely you all know Patrick Mahomes, you know, uh, but I won't talk football right now, but uh, anyway, uh, it, it won't matter. They won't come. And so we need to go. And so we need to plant the gospel where people live, learn, work, and play and develop biblically functioning communities out where people are. So these two strategies, the hybrid strategy, come and go strategy, began to, to be the banner under we, which we help people understand how we were implementing this disciple-making movement strategy along with a very attractional, uh, collectional type strategy that, that existed um, from, um, from the time you know we, we've been around. Um, so uh, now we're in this crisis that I'm sure you're in as well. Um, our world is opening up. Um, and, and so I, I'm interested um, from your perspective, um, what is it that this COVID world has created inside you? And, and where are your discomforts? Uh, I had some discomforts. I felt like that the, the local church collectional strategy was not um, going to be the strategy that God used to reach the Great Commission. Um, it would be one of them, a small part of it, but not, not a big one. But I'm wondering about your strategy. Um, where, where, where are your discontents right now? And, and maybe it's this crisis that has helped that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask Bruce to, to put us into groups here for a minute. And, and just to really respond to um, a couple of basic questions. Uh, one is, what has this period uh, taught you about the gaps that exist in your ministry? Okay, what, 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 what about the gaps in your ministry um, that, that are there? Um, and then second, um, is everybody already going to groups here, Bruce? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Let me I'll, 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 I'll put the questions in. I, we can broadcast to everyone once they get into groups. Go ahead and choose. Go ahead and accept your groups. 
and I'll broadcast the uh, instructions into your group chat. Bruce, you want to pick up Martin's comments? Yeah, um, he just talked about how, um, uh, so they're in Birmingham, they're obviously uh, in the same situation, lockdown. So, so they've been encouraging each other in their small community to um, do um, two plus two plus two, call two friends, two people that they know are needy. Um, and then, um, so they're, they're engaging with um, a large refugee uh, population, Syrians and Kurds. And, um, and then also two, I, I don't know if it was um, cross-cultural workers. <clears throat> so, so anyway, I just <clears throat> appreciated the, the creativity and, and um, taking advantage of the situation, so. Cool. So let's, uh, again, the chat box is available. He wants to ask questions. I'm gonna just show a couple of graphics here and maybe walk you through some of the, the, the learnings that, that we've had in, in this process. Um, if we can think about this in terms of three movements, uh, early on, I, I've been at this for 12 years now. Early on, uh, I, there was a huge mistake made uh, about this concept of disciple making and then attaching the concept of movements, seeing the, the gospel go viral. And, and that was that, um, that it was just a training function, that people just need to be trained differently. And so many, many churches across the U.S. and different areas, uh, uh, a lot of us got on airplanes and we trained and trained and trained and trained and, trained and we didn't see much traction. And it dawned on me uh, is it, it's not a training function, it's a culture function, that we're not building uh, just new skills, we're building new mindsets. Uh, we're, we're actually offering a different language, a different set of behaviors, uh, a different way of engaging the lost world. And so there was a need to understand that our mindsets needed to shift. And so I've delineated a few here, and I, we won't even sort of get to many of them, but um, Bruce is going to you know, offer a, a training. We're partnering with uh, the Gather to Scatter to, to offer some training in this if you'd, you'd like to sort of ex be exposed to some of this. Um, but you know, I mentioned the first one for me was I, I had to gain a, a, a multiplicative mindset. I had to think about my strategies, my methodologies, not at the first generation, but at the second and third generation. And I ask myself the question constantly, will this multiply? Um, and you know, unfortunately for me and, and for us, uh, we, we exist in a nation and a, a culture that has this concept of exceptionalism in it. Um, our whole culture is built around exceptional people. We watch them sing and act and play and um, that kind of stuff. And it's, it's, it's just the, this exceptionalism. Even in the Christian culture, you know, the, is the people who write the books and who's, who speak at the conferences. And I, they're the exceptional people. Um, and so our Christianity ha has been uh, just uh, soaked with this exceptionalism. And, and what we find in the pages of the Gospels is Jesus really worked with ordinary people, you know, and most of us have preached about that, you know, idea that just these ordinary guys that Jesus called to himself, they were such a, a curious, a curious band of individuals, unique in every way and stuff. Um, and, and so, unfortunately, what, what's happened when we think about this is, is uh, we, we tend to think about the, this exceptionalism uh, in terms of, you know, certain people can do this. We had to come to the, I had to come to the realization that, that my methodologies had to be available to everyone, not just exceptional people. Um, and, and so the ordinary average person, uh, despite their education level, despite their personality, uh, didn't matter where they, what, what they ended up on the Myers-Briggs or the DISC or, or the Enneagram or anything like that. Uh, it had to, 
apply to everyone. So that multiplicative mindset or moving from making uh, disciples to making multiplying disciples was, was radical for me because it put under the microscope all the methodologies that I had used, um, all the books that I had suffered, made people suffer through reading with me and engaging, you know, knowing God by Jab Hacker, you know, the most impactful book in my life outside the Bible. And so many of, of my disciples ha had had to read that. And, and it, I got it at a moment in my life when uh, my story and what Packer was saying met up and made a difference. Mm -hmm. But um, that wasn't true in their lives all the time um, and stuff. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to replicate my experience in them and it just didn't work. So uh, the second one is, uh, you know, trusting the qualified. Uh, we, we tend to have, you know, who's qualified and every one of us has a certain standard in our minds as opposed to releasing the willing. Uh, that has, you know, I mean, even right now we have a, uh, has some cool multiplication going on uh, in the lives of some disciples. And um, in the, in the traditional mindset of the church, I probably wouldn't release them to do what they're doing. Um, and, and yet, uh, God is working amazingly through them, and uh, and yet that's you know they don't they don't meet a lot of the qualifications that that we normally put up. Um, reproduction to replication is just understanding that um, we have a mindset about reproduction that is time based, and it kind of relates to the first one in a sense. Is that uh, I have a grandson Hollis who's uh, six years old. And, you know, my hope for him is that he will become a teenager and a, and a young adult, and he will find a, an incredible uh, gal to marry, and they'll be married for a few years, and then they will reproduce and, and have my great-grandchildren. Um, and that's the kind of mindset we have spiritually, I think, in that sense, this longitude, uh, where, whereas Jesus had more of a replication, more of a viral understanding of, of the gospel. Um, so a virus, as we all know very well, as uh, soon as the virus is present, it's able to uh, replicate. It's able to move to another source and stuff. And uh, I believe that's, that's the methodology that Jesus had. Um, he was pushing people to replicate just quickly, very quickly. Um, and as a result, the gospel can spread freely uh, apart from the bureaucracies that, that we've laid around it today. Um, so, and we can just keep going on down the list here uh, of things. Uh, they're, they're all listed again, uh, most of them in uh, uh, spent matches, but let me, let me just stop there and, and see um, if there are any you know, questions that 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 uh, let me check the chat box here um okay uh okay all right so no no questions yet so all right so let me let me move on to a second uh graphic here um uh, so think about this in terms of three phases of of cultural change there's first the mindset shifts, and all of these are, uh, they start and they never stop. So you start this mindset shift, and I begin to, to work with mindset shifting, and then we move into a momentum. Um, it, it's so important in this process as we're changing culture um, to get to social proof. You know, you've all seen the inno curve, the innovation. You got the innovators and the early adopters make about 16%. Of, of people who immediately grab a hold of new things and and they really are driven by scarcity they love the idea that these ideas are not held by many people and they love being on the forefront of putting new things into practice but then there's a gap or a chasm that exists between um, those early adopters and and the late adopters and and there's a difference in in the sense of their mindset the mindset of the person on the other side of that chasm is someone who needs social proof. That is, they need to know it works. They need to see it working somehow. So 
when we're in the process of building, you know, mindset shifts, we've got to create this sense of momentum, uh, a, a sense in which people are getting their fingernails in the dirt and they're inviting friends in uh, to read the Bible, discover what it says about life, to learn to obey it and share it and watch transformation take place. I mean, that was so important early on in Shoal Creek. Um, even before I really understood what I was doing, I was reading the book of Romans with three non-believing guys. And, uh, you know, a train conductor, a sort of out of work, in work sales kind of guy, and, um, and a guy who worked for the electric company. Uh, and uh, the, the two of the guys had strong Catholic backgrounds, uh, not not attending church, strong Catholic backgrounds. But we read the book of Romans together and watching them come to faith uh, by reading the book of Romans, not because I took them through the Romans road or not because I shared the first spiritual laws or the bridge or steps of peace with God or anything like that. I just let God bring them to himself as, as we read the book of Romans together. And all three of those guys are still today, they're kids. I mean, it's just amazing to see the, the impact that just reading the Bible, obeying it, sharing it had on their lives. And so you need that social proof for the, the late adopter to take place. So we start changing the mindsets, uh, we get the momentum going, and then only then you know, can, can we really get to movement um, in that process. So I'll show you one other um, slide here before we- See Roy? Uh, get off, yes, I see we yeah, got just some questions. Yeah, there were a number of people asked about terrorists. They saw that on your list. So before you leave that uh, last slide, just respond to the comment about terrorists or explain that, please. Uh, well, you know, I, uh, I, I uh, have had a lifelong fascination with terrorists. I have a friend who did his PhD at the University of Wisconsin in social media and got a chance to study the methodologies of terrorists in Indonesia. Um, and, and they have some of the greatest methodologies for, for getting people from uh, a static state to an active state, from a, an unengaged to an engaged state. And so when I think about this, uh, typically in a church, uh, we work like marketers. We go up front, we print four color brochures. We put it in everything that we can imagine. Uh, we shout it as loud as we can from the, from the front of the room so that people will get on board. And, and we have some, some social power there. It lasts for maybe um, 18 months or so and, and then it dips and we go do it again and we try to get something else uh, that we're going to push and, and get people excited about. A terrorist doesn't work in the middle of the room. They work around the edges. They find the disenfranchised people. And I like to think of them as wholly discontented people. There are so many people that exist in a local church who just won't say to the, the church leadership, uh, you guys don't know what you're doing. Um, and they, just, they just keep it to themselves because they have so many ideas. They, they, they have a, a redeemed imagination for what the gospel could do. But the leadership of, of and the way things have always been done, keep that redeemed imagination for being set free to let the gospel move where they live, learn, work, and play. A terrorist takes advantage of that. Uh, uh, terrorists work on the outside of the edges. They, they work on the disenfranchised, and they create a platform for the disenfranchised to have a huge impact. Now, I, I'm not saying I, um, I, I like what terrorists do in terms of their impact, but I am saying that I think they're some of the wisest uh, people on the face of the earth in terms of getting humans to do things that we never thought that, that they could do. And, and we could learn a lot from them um, as if you were to go out and Google Frank Hargrove and, and to look up his PhD dissertation at the University of Wisconsin and, and to see how effective they are at, you know, at getting a girl, an 18-year-old girl from Omaha, Nebraska, you know, to Syria to fight in a war that she knew nothing about. Um, and it's just amazing to watch that kind of, of, of stuff happen. So that's what I mean by terrorists is, is that. I hope that... Um, yeah, that's good, Roy. Uh, before you leave the slide on mind shifts, there was one other question on sure. form to function. Okay. 
Yeah, um, you know, uh, we, th that's just a design principle. Form always follows function. Uh, take for instance, when we were trying to break the, um, the sound barrier with aircraft. My father was in the Air Force. I grew up at the end of the runway on a lot of Air Force bases, so I love aviation. Uh, aviation history, and um, as we were attempting to break the sound barrier, we had airplanes with propellers, and they had certain functions, wing functions. Their wings were formed in certain ways, and the very early uh, attempts of that was to take those prop-driven aircraft way up high, as high as they could go, turn them straight down at the earth, and dive and see how fast they could go, and, and they discovered, uh, because uh, numerous people died doing that, that, that if we wanted to fly faster than the speed of sound, if that was the function that we were looking for, then the form of the airplane was going to have to change. We could no longer use propellers. We had to develop jet engines. We developed an airfoil so that the, the wing was, was radically different and so it would be stabilized. So form, what the form something takes, always follows its function. Unfortunately, for those of us uh, who uh, live in the legacy of Western Christianity, our theology and our methodologies are so well put together that, that when someone starts to change the methodologies, we tend to think of it as a theological uh, issue, and we fight to the death over methodologies. We saw that in in the music wars that took place in the 80s, you know, in the, in the local church, like, you know, hymns were, were, were something that Jesus gave us, and, and if we, you know, gave up that kind of stuff, you know, and, and, uh, and so the form always needs to be subservient to the function. Does that raise any further questions there? Roy, were you going to be touching on any of these other um, uh, dichotomies between the? I was going to jump off to another one. I can. What do you see something there important, Bruce? I was just going to open it up quickly. Are there, are there others that uh, you know the the idea of conversion and disciple making that might be something of um, you know um, we're interested not in converts but in disciples. What what does that mean? Um, I know that might be worth spending a few minutes to okay. talking about that. Yeah. It, it, you know, um, th that sort of happens uh, when you begin with the end in mind. So what do I want? You know, I, I want a multiplying disciple. And if, if that's what I want, then I, I really need to start there. I, I really need to start at that point of, of understanding what was going to get me to a multiplying disciple. I think, you know, we, we tend to, focus on conversion. We want to change the way someone believes, and, and we challenge their concepts of belief, whereas Jesus seemed to challenge their concept of trust. And so his first offer to people was not to believe in him, but to trust what he says, to, to act as if it's true. Now, unfortunately for us in the English language, you know, um, the word pistis, uh, faith, belief or trust translated all three uh, different ways but it, i i believe if if you went back to your bible and every place you saw the word faith um as a as a verb for instance have faith uh you know if you thought of it as trust it might change the quality of the kind of disciple making we do or the or what people think of it in terms of oh yeah i believe in jesus you know well it, do you trust in Jesus? Do you act as if what he says is true? And so uh, I think that when we start in this process of making disciples, as opposed to trying to get converts, uh, we, we actually see people converted in the traditional sense of what we think of and what we want, but we get much more than that. We, we get someone who starts with a pattern in their life of trusting what Jesus says is true. And therefore, there's not this dichotomy. You know, uh, if you read Spent Matches, I make a big deal about this. I don't see evangelism in the Great Commission. Um, I, I see that we've have, we have injected it there, 
And, and so we have these, this two phase thing. First, someone uh, we, we evangelize, they come to Jesus, and then we disciple them. And we use this term discipleship. Uh, I happen to believe that Jesus just talked about disciple making. He didn't really have that evangelism thing. In fact, the only place you find in the Bible where Jesus practices evangelism, if you were an evangelism explosion teacher like I was, you would fail him. Because when someone asks, how do I get to heaven? He tells them to give away all their money. Um, and, and so there's this, this understanding to realize, okay, um, we're, we're talking about trust here. We're not just talking about simple belief. And unfortunately, you know, if you move back in history, uh, the word faith or the word pistis actually has much more bearing in, in, in terms of that trust. And, and the word faith does too. Uh, but in the, in the culture of the West now, in, in the whole idea of kind of a Greek oriented culture, there's a, there's a mind and there's a, you know, a soul or a will. And those two seem to be separate in a Hebrew mindset. I don't think they're separate at all. They're there. It's a unity of a uh, worldview. So it's a lot of Thanks. words to answer. That was very good. Thanks. So let, let me quickly move on. I need to turn it back to you uh, here, Bruce, in a second. I want to share one more screen and just kind of give you an overview of, of what this looks like on the ground um, in, in this process. Um, so when, when it gets to the ground and, and I actually have to begin doing something about these big concepts, um, for me, it, it starts in the heart of God. It, the, the heart of the Father is, is to redeem his creation and his creatures. And, and he invites me uh, into this process. And so when I think about this, you know, from a historical standpoint, um, I, the heart of God uh, brought Jesus from heaven to earth, and, and he gathered around a few people who his command to them was to follow me, and, and he called them disciples. Um, and, and so he began this process to, of discipling them and offered them this opportunity to join him in recapturing his creation, his, and his creatures. Um, you know, for me, that starts a, a process of prayer. I, I want to keep company with my father because I want his heart in my eyes. I want to see my world differently. And so this first lap around the track for me as I began to train people to help them understand that you can't make a disciple until you are a disciple. And, and so uh, I began the process of keeping company with my father and growing and understanding who he is and what his heart is and what he wants for me. And, and I began a, a process of asking him to do what he says he wants to do in my world. And so that develops this this life of prayer, this life of dependence uh, upon the Father. Uh, and then I follow Jesus' example. I engage in a community. I believe everyone needs a target. You know, uh, a lot of people quote Romans 28, uh, Romans, Romans 8, 28, uh, you know, uh, uh, good, you know, and, and there's two things in that passage that we really need to be careful of understanding. You know, as all things work together for the good of those who, who love God, all right, who, who trust uh, what God says is true and live as if it's true and are called according to his purpose. And, and I think sometimes we miss that. Uh, you know, to, to be called is, is, is to hear. You, you've got to hear before you can be called. And so I think a lot of people uh, don't really have a sense of hearing from God about where, they're, where are they to engage. And when you put a pin in a map, uh, there are always people there. There are always faces and names. There's souls of people who are either heaven bound or hell bound. And, and so God calls us into this process of engaging a particular uh, target or population. It's bound in the Great Commission with every ethne, you know, every cul-de-sac, every block, every tribe, every people, every tongue. Uh, we see it at the end. They're all going to be there. So we engage and and. Jesus happens to provide kind of a clue in Luke 10 and Matthew 10 about this idea of finding spiritually interested people who have a network who are already healers and use them to reach a community. So oftentimes, you know, I find that 
uh, especially those of us who have white skin, uh, are trying to reach ethnic populations in the in the U.S. We we want to embed ourselves inside those populations, and and the real the reality is is that we're probably not going to be the people to reach them. It's going to be the people of peace that we connect with who are going to be the insiders who, who reach them. So I find those those insiders and I, I, I disciple them and release them into ministry. And so that that discipling process is simply what we refer to as the, as the discovery process. It's uh, reading the Bible, obeying it, and understanding it. And you can go out to there's, there's a discovery group app in both the um, Android and, and uh, iOS store. If you want to take a look at it, it's real simple, real basic, not much to it. But as disciples begin to, to emerge and people begin to be baptized and identify with Jesus, uh, there's a natural assembling into these uh, local fellowships, uh, uh, this ecclesia, these called out ones who are now uh, prosecuting God's purposes in this world and becoming redemptive communities that flourish together and, and draw people into themselves. And so they continue to multiply. This process just keeps going and going and going and going. And there's a, there's a continuum here that takes place from, you know, being a disciple, uh, learning to be a disciple, getting the habits of the discipled life down, becoming a disciple maker, what it's like to, to see that first generation, then becoming a multiplying disciple maker, what it's like to, to see multiple generations take place, and then a disciple making movement catalyst, what it's like to see you know, hundreds and thousands uh, of, of both uh, individuals and groups and, and churches began to be started. So um, I want to throw that that visual out there for all of you uh, to be able to see. So I'm going to stop talking, Bruce. Uh, and um, well, let me let me just answer one question here. David asked, uh, "What practical steps can we take to change the mindset of people in our church?" Um, well, I, I I would suggest that you make sure that you understand that the people, if, if you're a leader in a church. Um, those people bought a ticket for that train for a particular purpose because at one point you said it was headed to, um, you, you're, you're going to Seattle on that train. Uh, the last thing you need to do is to get on that train as a new conductor or a, uh, a conductor with a new idea and say, you know, I know you bought a ticket to go to Seattle, but we're going to Dallas instead. Now those people are going to be mad uh, because of that. So I would suggest that you act like a terrorist and not like a marketer that you find a small group of people, uh, a, a small group of, of, of interested, maybe uh, wholly discontented souls and begin to work with them. Um, and that process might be by, you know, reading spent matches or reading David Watson's book, Contagious Christianity, or coming to um, the, the, the uh, training that, that uh, Bruce is going to offer here in a minute to be a part of, of discovering how to teach people, how to use discovery in their life, how to get discipled habits in their life, and then be able to multiply those kinds of things. So start small, um, start really, really small, um, and, and, and get to the dirt quickly. Uh, if you stay in the theoretical time, uh, in all the theory and stuff, it never goes anywhere. You've got to get people into lostness, getting, inviting their lost friends to the table to read the Bible. Uh, believe it or not, the American Bible Society every year puts out a survey. Uh, two thirds of all Americans, it doesn't matter what coast they live on, uh, it doesn't, doesn't matter you know, what their religious heritage or backgrounds, two thirds of all Americans always say they want to know more about God, Jesus, and the Bible. They are not afraid of God. They're not afraid of Jesus. They're not afraid of the Bible. They're afraid of you and me because we have a reputation of cramming things down their throats. And, uh, and when we can create safe places for people to hear from God, uh, amazing things can take place. Yeah. Really great, Roy. Thanks. Say, um, Kathy had a question. Um, so would you say the form of the church doesn't really have the function of making disciples who make disciples? Um, kind of to follow up on what you were yeah. describing, the difference between um, uh, form and function. Yeah, I, I, would, I would say the proof's in the pudding. Um, 
you know, I, I could do this with you all and I have an eight and a half sheet of paper and ask you to lay out your disciple making lineage. You know, how many grandchildren do you have in the faith? Um, and what I find is in a typical group of leaders, uh, very few people have grandchildren. A lot of people have children, but they don't have grandchildren and great grandchildren. You don't, we don't find that multiplication taking place. So sometimes we make disciples, but very seldom do we make disciples who make disciples. Thanks, Roy. One final question from Ann, and you might want to read this yourself in the chat box. Uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, when, when we think of, when we are able to unleash ourselves from our culture, because we've all inherited a church culture from, from Europe. And, and if we think about the fact, I, I look at Shoal Creek, I, I, people don't call me pastor. I don't like titles. If you read Spit Matches, you, you know that. Um, I think there are many, many people um, in, in our fellowship that have the gift of shepherding. And, and we want to release them to shepherd. We, we want to release them. There are many people who, who have apostolic gifts, and we have all kinds of unreached areas in our city. Uh, that need that apostolic gifting to take the gospel there and to plant biblically functioning communities uh, where, where people are in that sense. Um, you know, we, we have, when we think about the word teacher, you know, we often think um, of, of teacher as delivering content, but the reality is that what's behind that word didaskalos and even, even more uh, strongly in the Hebrew is cause to learn, not deliver content. And, and so good teachers are people who help people, call, they cause them to learn. And so I, I think in, in leading a discovery group, for instance, it's what you do. You cause people to learn. You place the word of God in front of them and you ask them questions about that text. You cause them to get their fingerprints on the Bible. And when they get their fingerprints on the Bible, all of a sudden, you know, God begins to get root in their life. And when he takes root in their life, transformation takes place. You have caused someone to learn. You've become a teacher. So, um, you know, I, I think if we, you know, remove some of our Western, the scales that sit on our Western eyes, we begin to see these gifts in, in radically different ways. And we, we see them expressed by many, many more people than, than we allow them to be expressed with, you know, in our, typical forms that we have right now. Well, I think we'll, we need to abide by our schedule and we said we would conclude at 1130 Central Standard Time. Um, uh, Roy, did you have any final thoughts or? Yeah. Um, no, no, I'd be oh, glad. Go ahead, you know, Roy. I, I would, I would love, love to, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to partnering with you guys and, and providing training for people that want to continue the discussion. It's a long um, discussion that better engage with drip, drip, drip rather than a big flush, you know, so uh, this can start something, but it, 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 it really takes, you know, a lot of yeah. marinating to, to uh, get going. So Roy, um, this is actually a question. Um, so so I've got a slide that will show some some of the opportunities coming up for training. So one of the, the training opportunities that Roy mentioned, everyone, is is um, what they call Habits of Kingdom Multiplication. It's an eight-week disciple-making movement training course. Um, and you're just finishing up one one series, right, Roy? Yeah. I the jumped off of that one to jump onto this one this morning. Yeah. So that, that the next one will be starting in two weeks. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, around, around the, around the third or uh, fourth or week of May or first week of June. Yeah. Okay. So, um, you've got my contacts at the bottom there. Um, and please let me know if you're interested. Um, uh, as you know, we're, our initiative is based here in the Twin Cities, but, um, uh, for obvious reasons, this training is happening virtually. So you can you can follow it uh, from wherever you are. Um, 
so one of the I'm not sure about this, Roy. I might be wrong, but the training and coaching. The I don't think I don't know if the eight week training will you'll divide yourselves by affinity. You know, for example, those those of us who are serving in rural contexts or urban streets. Will that happen then, or is that is that following? Is that an opportunity that would happen subsequent? No, we'll try to get uh, we'll we'll try to piece together as many people that have similar affinities as possible in the training. Uh, but okay. in the coaching cohorts that come out of the training, that definitely happens. Now, it right. may not be geographically related. There may be, you know, someone in Nebraska with someone in, you know, West Virginia that are trying to reach, you know, similar type people that are trying to reach Somali refugees or something like that. Right. So we'll, we'll piece those, those things together. But we want to get you as close in the coaching environment into the similar affinities. Okay. Um, then our own From Scattered to Gathered initiative is going to be hosting a, a, a continuing the conversation Zoom events, and that will be in June. We'll we'll uh, get back to everyone with the with the date. We have your your email addresses, so we'll we'll send that out. So we're going to share uh, maybe go a little more in depth in in what Roy has shared this morning related to um, to kind of the philosophy behind this disciple making movements and discovery groups and um, how we can begin living our lives out loud, engaging our, our neighbors, whoever they may, might be. Of course, in our context and our, um, our aim is, is, is directed towards um, least reached immigrant communities. So, um, but uh, we would invite anybody who's interested to uh, please contact me and we'll, we'll be sending out some information in the, in the coming days. Um, finally, uh, next fall, we have yet to determine the date. Uh, this will be our third, um, third go around with the Discipling the Nations Next Door training. And um, the, the discovery group process is really the engine of our, of our, um, of our efforts to engage and reach our least reached communities here in the Twin Cities and beyond. So um, if you happen to be local, um, we would love to have you, you join us. And again, we'll be sending out more information, um, how to identify uh, and map uh, your, your neighborhoods to know who, is, who exactly is living there. Um, there's, as I mentioned at the beginning, we have a great team of practitioners, part of a network um, so they will be joining us and helping us in, in, in the discussion, the conversation, the, the, the teaching that happened in, um, during that half day event. Thank you for your participation in this. And hopefully it whetted your appetite. Um, and um, it was 90 minutes obviously is, is less than sufficient in treating such an important subject, uh, um, sort of resurrecting the, the priority of disciple making in, in our local church. Um, so, um, Roy, thank you so much. I, I, um, I um, said I was going to introduce my, my from Scattered to Gathered colleagues, um, John and Kathy Peterson, our teammates, and then John and Andrea Nargan, our, the North America Field Director for um, Converge International Ministries. So, so the focus of the, we've done a whole restructuring so that um, our focus in North America is, is on, on least reached immigrant peoples um, living in our, in, our, in our major cities, not exclusively, but, um, but uh, anyway, um, so glad to have uh, John and Kathy and, and John and Andrea as a part of our team. So, um, and they were a big help in, in uh, getting the invitations out and setting up um, this um, Zoom call and with the PowerPoints um, slides we have right here. Thanks, John Peterson, for, for your work on that. Um, but uh, uh, Roy, thanks again. Uh, I'm just going to close in prayer for those of you who are still with, with us. And thanks to, uh, to everyone who joined in um, from all over the Midwest, uh, the United States, and even um, across the ocean. So it's been so good to have this time together. Heavenly Father, thank you for um, uh, for uh, the gospel and um, we thank you for the beauty of Jesus and 
and all his his excellencies and attributes that um, draw people to him we um we thank you father that um as roy shared this morning um all we really need to do is is um point people to jesus and um and uh and we we pray that you would teach us how to do that how to open up the word of god um and um lead people to discover for themselves how remarkable um your messiah is and so um lord we pray in the for for every participant that joined us today that you would lead them in these days ahead um that um your spirit would be at work at their in their lives lord that there really would be a um a call on their lives to um um take the risk of um living their lives out loud and and engaging with that target group that you are revealing to them uh, maybe they already have a um, um some um a community that they're focused on father we pray that you would you give them fruit as they um walk by faith and they live obediently and they, they really trust who you say you are lord jesus and um we just pray that all for all of us that would be the case um, thank you so much for Roy. Bless his ministry. Bless um, Shoal Creek Church. Bless um, his role as North American Director for New Generations. We thank you for these brothers who are so focused on equipping and training uh, a generation of disciple makers um, who make disciples who make disciples. And um, so thank you, um, Spirit of Christ, for um, overseeing this time together. We we um, commit ourselves to you and and um, we, we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Bruce. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it. Hey, John's, John's handiwork there. Did a great uh, job. Good job, John. Thank you, Bruce, for hosting us. Thank you, Bruce and uh, Roy. Uh, thank you.